as a symbol of Sydney, but its construction was the result of over 100 years of discussion and planning. Work finally began on the bridge in September 1926, after consideration of several designs following the tender of the English company Dorman Long and Company Limited. This photograph, taken in 1926, shows the Dawes Point pylon at an early stage of construction. In the background is the southern approach to the bridge. By the middle of 1927, construction of the approach trusses was well advanced. The curved northern approach viaduct would soon reach the Milsons Point pylon. Dr. J.J.C. Bradfield, the engineer-in-chief, had originally planned to use a cantilever bridge, but the long straight portion on the north side meant a very sharp curve towards Milsons Point Station. The change to an arch bridge allowed a flatter and longer curve to begin at the northern shoreline. 28, the approaches were complete. The pylons had reached deck level and construction had begun on the creeper cranes to be used on the arch. Fabrication of the steelwork took place in the workshops at Milsons Point, where Luna Park and the North Sydney Olympic Pool now stand. Erection of the main bridge started in late 1928. This photo, taken in early 1929, shows the southern cantilever two panels out from its pinned base, as well as some of the anchor cables sloping from the top of the main truss over the top of the pylon. The cables were attached by temporary joints to the ends of the main trusses and looped through tunnels cut deep into the rock behind the pylons. The number of cables was progressively increased as the cantilevered main trusses stretched further over the harbour. Construction on the northern side, on the right in this photo, was kept seven months behind the southern side. The main reason was that if any problems were encountered on the southern side, steps could be taken to remedy them on the northern side. As a result, work on the northern side always proceeded more rapidly than on the southern side. By 1930, the two halves of the arch were only a few panels apart. At this time, Henry Mallard, a Sydney photographer and sales manager for Harrington's Photo Store, sought permission to film the construction of the bridge. Dr Bradfield refused for safety reasons, but Lawrence Ennis, the director of construction, gave Mallard permission and allowed him access to all parts of the bridge. Over the next two years, Mallard visited the site regularly, taking hundreds of photographs, as well as shooting movie film with the newly developed compact camera, shown here in his left hand. For many years, a copy of the resulting film was held by the Institution of Engineers, and in 1969, it was viewed by Frank Litchfield, then aged 80, who had been a supervising engineer during the construction of the bridge. As he watched the film, he provided the commentary which is used throughout this program. Uh, up through the front of the arch with the sway bracing, the, those three inch cables were used to crisscross the, the retention behind Ollie Jacks to give rigidity uh, to the structure as it was built out. Well, just for a minute, we reached the, the, the construction and got out to the 14th panel with the, with the train on the 13th panel, the deflection of the, uh, of the half cantilever, were about in that order of about three foot six. That's a creeper crane, weighs 600 tons, the jib uh, in favour of it being uh, 122 tons. There are the uh, buttress threaded screws to Lufton, the jib, uh, which, uh, which travels, cross-travelled on a rack and pinion drive from one truss to the other one. In addition to the main crane, there were also auxiliary hoists for lighter lifts and to assist in manoeuvring members into position. Mallard's shadow can be seen here as he films this scene, standing in a cage suspended from the crane. That's Mick Whittinson, a crane driver and a paper crane. 
He was on the maintenance for years too after that, after the bridge was finished. There were, there were telephonic communications with the train drivers and everybody concerned with any particular operation. They were all interconnected by telephone. So the lifting cleats on most of the cord members, uh, which went up to anything up to 150 tons, were so placed uh, that on lifting it, it uh, assumed that, uh, approximately the right angle of slope that it would have uh, taken when fixed in position. As you can see, there were four webs and two separate uh, half cords right throughout. This is the last lower cord of the northern cantilever. The completed southern cantilever truss is on the right. Once the last bottom cord member was held in place, it was possible to step across the gap at the crown. Ennis, followed by Hipwell, made the first crossing of the harbour by foot rather than by ferry. This diagonal member forms the last triangulation at the crown of the arch. It was an essential stage prior to closing the arch. The arch members were brought from the workshops on a pontoon and lifted into position by the creeper crane. The diagonal being lowered to complete the triangle prior to the erection of the post and the corresponding top cord section. You can see the lever, how tightly all these service boats were tightened. They required a length of pipe on the end of the span and two men pulling on it to tighten them. And that's due to the thickness of the plates. Certain of the plates were very thick and they had a uh, roller straight in the shot, but it didn't get all the, all the buckles out of the... Uh, it was very ever so slight, of course, but they had to be absolutely tight in contact over the whole surface of contact. All main cord members were assembled in pairs and are hollow. Access to the inside of the cord was through the manholes in each half member. During riveting, men inside would push the white hot rivets through the holes and brace them for the riveter to form the head. Uh, the riveting furnaces were oil fired for the most part. They did have some coke with rivet uh, forges, but for the most part they were oil fired. The longest rivet in the bridge was 14 inches long and weighed about 7 pounds. And there were uh, 690 tons of field rivets, let alone the shop one rivets. And there were about, uh, the total number of rivets, over, they tell me, was about 5 million. The manholes were later covered, but they still provide access for internal inspections. That's the cage we used to go down onto the pontoon. Uh, we, would, uh, we get a launch out from uh, my uh, workshop where my office was and I get on point the pontoon. Most of the, uh, the trade brought out the nucleus of workmen, tradesmen, particularly in the, fabric, the fabrication and also on the erection, but the, the bulk of the, uh, of the uh, working force were Australian. The majority of them were Australian. certain amount of risk, we were always, obviously always falling, falling onto the pontoon, service bolts and nuts and things, that you had to take the risk, it was always much safer, I mean, once you felt, it felt much safer once on top. They, they did have a, uh, they did have a little cubicle with a two inch plate on the top, but no one ever went into it, it was bad for their morale. Oh, there were uh, 17 unfortunate chaps killed, mostly from uh, things falling on them, very few actually uh, lost their balance, but one or two did. And uh, one or two killed in the shops getting tangled up with the uh, batteries of drill. They, uh, they would, uh, you know, they would try and stand up on the plates and the cuffs of their trousers to get into the, in the drill. In the cables to the to extremity of the top cord. The cables were arranged in eight rows of 16, 128 in all. Yeah, those are the hydraulic jacks. The, um, the uh, sockets were picked up with, with two nine-foot, three-inch diameter bolts passing into a, a, a saddle over the eleven-inch diameter pin in the link and then continuing to house the hydraulic jack and, and uh, if they wanted to ease the nuts for running them out as it was done in the lowering of the operations the, the hydraulic pressure would be applied that just eased the weight off the uh, nuts and they were, they were able to unscrew them by hand.
There was uh, a gap of about three foot seven and a half inches at 72 degrees Fahrenheit at that stage before lowering operations commenced. A temporary hinge arrangement was attached to the ends of the bottom cords together with a tapered steel locating spike which helped to align the two halves. When the ends of the cantilevers met, the temporary crown unit formed a structural hinge. The uh, lowering operations occupied 12 days and nights working two 12 hour continuous shifts. Uh, they commenced on about the 7th of August 1930 and finished on the 19th of August 1930 because that's the time that when all the ferry services converged on the quay, so that everybody, most, the greater majority of people would have an opportunity of witnessing the event. Uh, the closing of the arch actually took place at 10 p.m. the night before on the 19th, but the, uh, the signal was, uh, it was advertised that uh, the uh, operation would be indicated by the breaking of the uh, Union Jack and the Australian flags at, at the tops of the jibs of the two creeper cranes at the centre. And when that, uh, it was a very thrilling moment, because when that occurred, everything that had a siren at the ships and anything that could make a noise made it. And it was a terrific, uh, terrific din, but it was very thrilling, actually. To, uh, I was up on there with Mr. Hipwell and Mr. Mark and the shop superintendent at the time. ...to a self-supporting three-hinged arch. This was a temporary condition, allowing the bottom cord to take the thrust of the arch while the top cord was completed. When the bridge became a three-hinged arch, there was a thrust of 40,000 tonnes on each of those bearings. This post is the first of three members that closed the open triangle at the crown. Note the foreman using the telephone to the crane driver. This centre post maintains the depth of the arch truss at the top of the bridge by supporting the last top cord members. After the centre post was in place, the two top cord members completed the arch truss work. That's a, the upper cord section being put up, and the, the numbering was, the, the lower panel points were even numbers, and the, and the, the upper panel points were numbered with odd numbers. Uh, giving that member the correct tilt, the uh, auxiliary hoist was on one, is attached to one end of the, the cord, and the main lift is taken at the point of balance. This was the scene at the top joint looking towards the south side of the arch. The inner half of the last top cord on the north side is held in place, ready for the temporary bolts at its end joints. All the steel that could, it was specified because of all the steel that could be manufactured in Australia was supplied in about 23 percent steel, or 27 percent rather, of steel came from Australia. Uh, the, all the, uh, most, all the uh, silicon steel, which is about 30 percent uh, stronger in compression than ordinary carbon steel, came from uh, Mr. Dormelong's works in Middlesbrough. This is the arrangement at the crown of the arch prior to conversion to a two-hinge arch. After all arch members were in place and the top cord had been made continuous, the hinge could be removed and replaced by fixed plates, making the bottom cord continuous. The first step was to fill the gap in the top cord. Now, in order to uh, bring about the two-hinge condition, it was necessary to to push back the extremity of the top cord from five inches. And for that purpose, they had four 960-ton uh, hydraulic jacks working at about four tons per square inch hydraulic pressure. And the jacks were, uh, were located on the flanges of the, uh, the cords, the, one at the bottom flange and one at the top flange, and uh, with the saddle and the pin in between them. So it was possible to push them back and then put packs in if it was calculated on the day, the correct amount of jacking to be done, it was dependent upon the load on the bridge at the time and also the temperature. They had some 40-odd thermometers all over the bridge in order to determine that operation. The crown of the lower, cord, uh, the, the lower cord joint rose 13 inches, 13 and a half inches up. Manual jacks were also used as a safety measure to maintain the gap should the hydraulic jacks fail. When the correct gap had been attained, they sent down a message to the... These packs were on the planing machine in the shop, and they were, were planed down to the necessary thickness of all speed and brought up to the, the job in the shortest possible time and put in. Then the jacks released back onto the packs, and then it became a two-hinged arch. 
With both cords continuous and taking the thrust, the arch was now in its final two hinge state. Each of those cables would uh, weigh about eight and a half tons and fell 100 feet long, and they were arranged in rows of eight rows of 16 at the uh, anchorage, and then uh, before going into the ground, they were in 32 rows of four, and down in the, the, the anchorage tunnel at the lowest point was 130 feet below sea level, and down at that level, they were in 64 rows of two. The hangar was, uh, was laid horizontally in a cradle built of two railway singer girder sets in tandem with uh, horns at each end to uh, house the hangar. The hangar was 198 feet long, or not 200 feet for that matter, and uh, as it was lifted up, the uh, auxiliary hoist <coughs> turned it into the vertical position. And you'll notice when it's being lifted, this horn on this, this cradle allowed the uh, the uh, top of the hangar to come up and make contact with the gussets underneath the cord while the ropes held down, hung down the side of the cord. This view southwards from Milson's Point shows the arch complete with both creeper cranes at the crown. The hangar is attached under the arch rib and the cradle stands clear. Ennis and Bradfield worked well together and always attended important stages of construction. You can see the ropes from the crane are hanging down to the, eccentrically from the axis of the hangar to allow it to come up under, be underneath the bridge. That's lower, lowering the, uh, the lifting cradle from the hangar after it's been attached to the board. The project had its share of bad weather. In September 1930, this westerly gale was filmed by Mallard as he waited for a hangar to be erected. The wild conditions caused a postponement and the pontoon was taken back to the loading bay in the workshop. But the first hangers were soon in place, ready for the decking. The average weight of the, of the cross girders over the weight bridge was 108 tons, actually. That was the only member erected by the aid of two cranes. They happened to be there, they used them. All the other cross girders were picked up by the centre point by one crane. The first cross girder was put up in its entire length. All the subsequent cross girders were put up at the little bracket to hold the footpath and the outside railway line uh, were put on separately after the, the, the carcass of the uh, girder had been erected. The cross girders were connected by pins to the hangers. The large pinhole can be seen here in the bottom of the hangar. The battering ram is <laughs> very effective for that purpose. Each cross girder arrived with the pins resting in cradles at the side. The work platforms were added later. One gets used to height, you grow with it, with it. I was pretty scared on the first span when I first started. But one gets used to the height. But when that cross girder was put across there, we only had a flimsy rope on one side, and I went landed with a cage on that, only about 22 inches wide, full studded with rivet heads, and with the shimmer of the light off the water, off the mackerel surface, it was most confusing. I felt most insecure for a while. You <laughs> get used to it. The first time I fe really felt the height. While work continued above the harbour, the pylons were also approaching their final shape. The pylons are hollow concrete chambers faced in granite. Dr. Bradfield said of them, the granite-faced abutment towers and pylons, simple and elegant, are the architectural features of the bridge and harmonize with the lines of the arch. They give the touch of distinction to the bridge, which would otherwise be an immense utilitarian steel structure. The pylons added half a million pounds to the cost of the bridge. The granite for the pylons was quarried at Maruya on the New South Wales south coast where a temporary township was set up. Work commenced at the site in 1924. To shape the rock, lines of closely spaced holes were drilled. The granite was then split and scabbling machines worked off the rough. Final shaping took place in the workshop. 
As there were not enough granite masons in Australia, Dorman Long brought them from Italy and from Aberdeen in Scotland. At its peak, the Maruya Quarry employed 250 workers. Finally, each stone was numbered for fitting into place at the bridge site. Wastage from the quarry was crushed and used in concrete for the pylons. The crushed granite acted as the ship's ballast and also as a bed for the shaped blocks. Three 400-tonne ships with specially designed hulls were built to transport the granite from Maruya to Sydney. Docks for unloading were built next to each pylon. Altogether, some 18,000 cubic metres of granite facing was needed for the bridge project. These timber frames, known as centering, were used to form the arches over the footways and railway tracks. in Bradfield's plans for the city railway system and electrification of the suburban lines. And about a test load of roughly 8,000 tonnes of uh, locomotives and tenders full of water uh, for various, uh, various tests. Uh, at one stage they were put all on the quarter point, which is a very severe test. And of course, considerable distortion, of course, of the arch. Measurements were taken of all these distortions, which have worked out pretty closely to those that calculated. That's Mr. Davison, the Minister for Works. That's Mr. G.W. Mitchell, the Director of Public Works, on the right. I don't know whether that was the first tram, but it is certainly one of the early ones that went across the bridge. The tracks on the eastern side of the bridge were used for trams for almost 30 years, travelling through tunnels to Wynyard Station. By the early 1960s, they had been covered and are now used for road lanes 7 and 8. The canopy of cantilever beams on top of each pylon supported flying scaffolding on all four sides. Workmen on the scaffolds scrubbed the granite faces clean. The cleaning process started at the top and worked down. Finally, the great day came. A pair of ornate gold scissors were specially made and presented to Premier Lang for the ribbon cutting ceremony. The opening ceremony was followed by another on the northern side and then a procession moved proudly across the bridge.
Today, around 176,000 motor vehicles and 400 trains cross the Harbour Bridge every weekday. It is maintained by a team of approximately 100 men and completely repainted every 12 to 15 years. No major components of the bridge have been replaced since it was built and it remains in very good condition. It is expected to provide service until well into the next millennium.